So could you monitor a little bit? Um, yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. We will do that. That's excellent because I'm more than happy to to uh, if someone have some questions or want to comment or so as we go about. Uh, so thank you, thank you again. I'm delighted to give this uh, talk here for you in your your seminar series. It's it's an honor. I'm sitting here in my office in in Stockholm, um, far away. Uh, we are all under difficult situations these days, but if we should look at something positive, is that we can uh, uh, be much more active globally, right? We are participating in workshops and and so on. So I'm I'm very happy to be with you there in uh, IIT Bombay. Um, so. I'm going to give a talk on, uh, I call it cyber physical control of automated transport systems. So it's it's something we have been working on here in my group for, for quite some time, 10, 15 years or so. Basically rethinking how we do transportation using control technologies and other technologies. Um, not focusing on people we are transporting ourselves right every day and there is a lot of has been a lot of hype around that can we have automated cars and and uh, can we you know do we have to drive take driver license in the future and so on i will look at another part of that problem and that is how do we transport the rest everything that we use in our daily life and and in 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 society in general. So the goods transportation, which is an, a, a huge part of all transportation in the world. So this is something which we get interesting f quite some time ago. And here in Sweden, um, you know, I've been working in my group, have had many PhD students and postdocs uh, working on different aspects of this problem, as you will soon see what it, it means. So I just want to highlight here that uh, the, the, the work, the result I present is, is uh, uh, collaborations with many bright uh, young people here who have been in my, in my research groups and some are still here working with, with me. So let's put the problem here and let's present that in a very, in, in oops, what happened now? Uh, let's see now, it ended. No, you still see my screen? Yeah, you can see uh, you just okay. Okay. So let's come to the, uh, the problem. I will pose the overall problem here um, very simplistically. So we, we transport goods mainly between, uh, you know, harbors, factories where people live and so on. So we can take a, a country, in this case, I took Germany and I ask myself, how can we more efficiently transport goods across Germany? And a lot of goods, of course, goes to where people live in the major cities of Germany in this, this case, and they are transport on, on highways. So how, how big problem is this? If we look at how is transport happening, of course, it happens through, through trucks, like the one you see on the pictures to the right here. <clears throat> And in, in Europe, there are a couple of millions of these trucks that goes across the continent and transport goods. So we are not talking about the logistic inside the city or so. We are, we are talking about the long, what is called long haulage trucks here. I, I was not able to find the figures uh, now from, uh, for, for India, but uh, you, you will probably imagine, because this is typically proportional to the size of the country, roughly speaking right so we will think about a similar a similar figure so that's the size of the problem if you want the 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 carrier here are the trucks so as control engineers or control students we can now think about this as a large uh, real time distributed control system right so how can we efficiently transport these this goods around? And what is interesting, if you think about how this happens today, it's, it's manual labor here. There is a person sitting in each truck, driving it and deciding when should it stop, when should it go, what, that, you know, what road to take and so on. So it's really not an automated system today at all. 
So uh, how, can we do that? Can we automate this system? So I would like to do two things. I would like to automate the system because th that has a lot of benefits, as you know, um, from, from your other courses in control. Automation gives a lot of benefits coming to safety and so on. Um, but also I would like to save the world. I would like to make the, the fuel saving here maximal. So today, most of these trucks goes on diesel fuel and they pollute and they, they are bad for our climate, as you know, and so, so on. So can we now make it more, more um, efficient, more fuel saving? I, I am not interested in a pure academic exercise here. I want to have something which, which can be implemented and that, that would work out there. So I don't want to change completely completely the route and when and so on these, these uh, vehicles go. But see, how, how can I just improve this a little bit? Of course, as I said, why, why focus on fuel and automation? This pie chart is the life cycle cost of a truck. And you see that, so, so you think about it from the viewpoint that you own now a few trucks. So then, uh, at least in Europe, you spend one third of your money on the fuel, another third on the driver's salary. So if you now could, uh, you know, reduce the cost there for these two pieces, you can save a lot of, of money for the individual uh, heavy duty vehicle or, or for more. So let me illustrate the system we have developed. So we say that we are transporting across Europe. We have four different cities we have two transportation missions happening during a segment there in the middle these two trucks or these trucks share uh, uh, the road in time and space and then they can go together in a road train like that if we knew across europe where trucks are going we could now optimize so that they go together as much as possible so if we look at a single vehicle train or a platoon, it looks like this. This is our system running now in, in some experiments for a few years ago. So here we regulate automatically the distance between the trucks. You see there are drivers here in the driver's seat, but they are not doing much in this case. They are monitoring the system. So automatically we regulate and make sure that they are going uh, close to each other. But that is not enough. If we should have such a system operating, uh, we need to be able to form the platoon while we are driving. So here comes a truck that now merge with the other two trucks and form a bigger platoon. This happens now automatically. There will also be other vehicles, of course, cars on the road, and there could be a car now that is manually driven where the car driver decides to, I want to sneak in here or I want to turn right uh, soon and so on. And then you see automatically now the system open up. It informs the operator now. Uh, and, and then when the human driver for some reason decide to leave, then we, we, we make that distance between the vehicles shorter again. So there is a lot of automation that has to happen in this system, which is not just driving this track. And of course, safety is number one priority. So let's say something happens in front of the first vehicle or the vehicle have to, to stop instantaneously, just as you saw in this, in, in, in this video here. So this is an existing system that we have, as I said, we have worked on, on this for a long time. So the vision we have now in the future is that we will have, just like you see in this cartoon here, we will have a lot of trucks that are going across the, the countries and they will now um, transport goods, but they will also be able to form these platoons of trucks as they go, because they will benefit from that in the sense that you saw in that, in that video. So if you think about that, how should that such a system be constructed? What is the architecture from a control viewpoint? Uh, what should it look like? So this is our proposal that we have been, been developing. So on the lower level, we have a vehicle controller which makes sure that the vehicle goes in this type of platoons, as you saw. One level up, we have something that, call, that is called the platoon manager. 
So the platoon manager, what it does is that it, for instance, makes sure that this merging happened that you saw in the video. Further up here, we have the platoon coordinator. The platoon coordinator makes sure that these two vehicles, for instance, know that they could meet over at this point and then start platooning. So that is one level up. So there is a, what we call the strategic layer where we can optimize the operation across multiple fleets of vehicles. And on the top level then, you have a fleet management system. So these type of systems are existing today. They are helping the, the, the owner of the track. So they're basically a logistic company to coordinate that transport mission and coordinate the logistic that they are of what they are transporting. And of course, this system now, as I described, this needs to be integrated with that. So today you often have, for instance, people who are in an office like you see down to the right here which are overseeing the whole operations that can be thousands of trucks going across a company uh, a continent or, or or so so we we have as i said we have developed these architectures and and if you want to know more about so to say get an overview of this we wrote a paper in proceedings i triple e a few years back but we are also implementing this we are collaborating with all the major truck manufacturers in Europe today, and they are implementing our technology. And you see them here. In Sweden, we have two of these uh, companies. They are called Volvo and Scania, and we are working with both of them, and they are testing this. And you see the, some of the experiments you see and we show movies with is in collaboration with these companies. But let's start from that architecture, and let's look a little bit from the bottom and going upwards. And I, I won't, so to say, describe all the details here, but I'm going to give a few snapshots of what, uh, what has been done and some theory behind it and so on. And I start with the very basics. Let's start on the bottom layer. Why do we do platooning? Why could I say that this is fuel saving? So it's simple physics here. So we have two tracks, as you see, on some distance. The color coding here is the air pressure that is on a truck. And what is interesting to notice is that when the second truck in this platoon moves closer to the first truck, you see that the air pressure on the second truck reduces. So what is the consequence of that? So now here I plot the relative distance between the vehicles in a platoon on the x-axis on the air on the y-axis, I have the air drag reduction. And what you can notice is that when we are 10, 20 meter between the tracks, we can save 40, 50% of, of air drag. Yes, we can reduce the air drag significantly. So something similar as if we are biking and you bike behind uh, a friend or so, you, 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 you feel like the air drag is being reduced. So 40-50% of air drag reduction gives something of the range of 5 to 20% fuel reduction. In our experiments here, a typical figure is 10%. So 10% fuel reduction for a truck that basically goes 24-7. So this type of long haulage truck, they, they run all the time. So if you imagine now, as I said, we have a couple of millions of them in the world. We have tens or, 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 or more of millions of these trucks. If we could save this amount of fuel, you know, it would be enormously good for the climate and for, for uh, other things as well. So there is a lot, a lot of, of potential in this. Let's leave the motivation and potential. Let's now go into the technology. So what does this system system here I'm describing, how does it look like? So let's first educate ourselves. How does it look inside a single vehicle? So what does the control system look like? So the control system for driving the truck forward with a, a, a set speed here. So in this figure, I show the communication system inside a truck where you have the sensor information on the left, you have the controllers in the middle, and then you have the actuators to the right. So you see the sensing information we need for, for platooning here is information from other vehicles, 
but we also have GPS information from our own vehicle. We have radar measuring the distance to vehicle in front and so on. This information goes in to a cruise controller. The cruise controller in the most basic setting tries to run your vehicle with a constant speed. So the cruise controller now calculate the actuation. So basically the reference speed here, and it goes to the what is called the energy management system. But that's not enough because we need also to control the braking and the gear, gears of the truck. So this is other actuations here. If we now do something more advanced, like what I, I showed you here with platooning, this cruise controller now is called a collaborative adaptive cruise controller. So that is a cruise controller which have some more intelligence, which I'm going to dig into a little bit deeper in, in a minute here. But I want to emphasize with this slide that notice that if we now are running a platooning system, so with the collaborative cruise controller or just an adaptive cruise controller or a regular cruise controller, it doesn't matter. It's just a piece of software, a piece of code that we have implemented inside a ECU inside the vehicle. So this is fantastic, right? We don't have to redesign the whole vehicle. It's only a software as long as the vehicle is equipped with the standard type of equipment that the high-end vehicle have today. So that means that if we are platooning now, the vehicles have to then run in this platooning mode. So they run with their collaborative adaptive cruise controller. They communicate information over a wireless network, but they also communicate implicitly through sensor information, through the radar, uh, sensor that is every uh, vehicle have in front here. So this is how, so to say, the control, the network control system look like. So how is the control now? So how do we regulate the inter-vehicle spacing here? So this is a very interesting control problem that has been studied for a long time. And, you know, it's easy to, to see that it's you know, if we don't know how long our platoon will be, we typically would like to have a distributed control strategy so that the vehicle here takes into account only information in its neighborhood to regulate the distance to the vehicle ahead. If we are not careful when we do this, we can get something which is called string instability. So this has been known for many, many years. So what can happen is that the first vehicle here it, it has a disturbance. There is some braking or there is a, a road grade deviation or so. And then that disturbance can now propagate in the platoon. And as you see on, in, this, in this plot down here, as we go to, to, to vehicles further and further back in the platoon here, actually this disturbance becomes larger and larger. So it's a propagation in increase that, that it, it causes this problem. And of course, this could be very bad and results in, in a collision. As I said, this goes back. And studying this platooning and so goes back to, to more or less a seminal paper from MIT by Levin and Athens in the, in the 60s here. So, but a lot of others have studied this and so on. We also come up with different solutions to this, and I'm going to show you a, a, a very nice result we obtained, um, which made us rethink how the control of vehicle platoon should be done. And I, I'm going to present this from the insight we gained from experiments. In control, it's very important to do real experiments to understand the problem. So in this case, we are here in Northern Europe, in Sweden. Stockholm is over there. So we are on a highway that goes 45 kilometer uh, west here of, of Stockholm. So we went there over several weeks with these three uh, vehicles in a platoon, going back and forth, back and forth, checking our system. So you see here is the road altitude. So it's not completely flat, but it goes a little bit up and down like that. So we, we collected a lot, a lot of information from these experiments where we were running this system automatically. The controller we tested was such a controller from the literature, which was a distributed control structure. So you have a vehicle controller for the first vehicle, 
uh, regulating the velocity of that vehicle, communicating its state to the second vehicle, that vehicle regulate the velocity of the second vehicle, etc., etc. So uh, what, what I plot here now is just a short segment, a few kilometers of that long road, and you see here the altitude is going up and down, up and down like that, then we have the speed of the vehicles and the second plot. We have the distance between the two first vehicle, the torque and the braking force applied in these vehicles. So look now what is happening. So the, we see that the first vehicle, the blue line here, its velocity goes up a little bit when we go over downhill the first time. I mean, it's very natural. We have a heavy vehicle, it accelerates. When it goes uphill again, the velocity of the first vehicle go down and so on. Look now what's happening with the second vehicle, the red line here in the second plot. You see that that is following quite well in the beginning the velocity of the first vehicle, but it then after some time starts to oscillate. So when we go downhill the second time with the second vehicle, you see that the velocity of that vehicle is oscillating around the velocity of the first vehicle. And there is no reason that you should do that, right? Notice from the third plot that the distance from the second vehicle to the first vehicle is also oscillating then. So imagine sitting there as a driver in the second vehicle. So you, you are getting closer to the first vehicle, going further away and back and forth like this. So it's probably pretty scary to sit in that vehicle. You see that the torque is also oscillating of the second vehicle and actually the automated braking sets in three times when we go downhill here. So this is, you can see, this is very bad results. We don't want to brake and we don't want to have these oscillations because we want to save fuel. If we are braking, we are wasting fuel here. So when we got these results, we wonder, is it something, some problem with these distributed control architectures that have been proposed over 50 years in the literature? So is it some, should we rethink how we do control of this? And is there a role that the topography variation plays here? And how should we regulate the distance of this? So we really try to, to think fundamentally of this problem. And let me illustrate what we come up with here. So let's illustrate it when we now think that we are going along a road, which goes over here as a flat road, right? And then we start going uphill. The, that vehicle that you see here, assume that that would like to keep a constant velocity. We will never know exactly when the uphill comes, right? And when you come to that uphill, that constant velocity will experience a little bit of disturbance. So the velocity is going to be a, a little bit here, uh, have a disturbance, it will be lower. And then if the vehicle is strong enough, it will go up and it will keep the same velocity as we are going up here. So that velocity now we can plot, as you see here, over time where we have a dip here, but we can also plot the velocity over space. So over the length of the road here, and there will of course also be such a dip here around this point where the hill starts go up. Assume now that we have an, a platoon. Assume that the vehicles behind is able to regulate their distance to the vehicle in front perfectly. So the vehicle here, the second vehicle, keep a perfect distance D here to the vehicle ahead. If that happens and the first vehicle now experience that disturbance, what is going to happen is that every vehicle is going to experience the same disturbance instantaneously. If you now think about, we plot it over space instead. The second vehicle is over here when it experienced that disturbance. So over space now, the second vehicle experienced disturbance at another point in space. And the same for the third vehicle. If we now continue, think about that we animate this slide forward in time, the second vehicle is now going to experience the first disturbance over again, right? There will be another disturbance and so on. So you see there is a problem if you think about it, we are regulating the system just according to the disturb according to the distance in this way that we actually need to take into account. 
We don't have to regulate on the distance, we can regulate on headway, or we can regulate on the time gap. So imagine that we fix a time that we should keep here between the vehicles. If we do that and we set the time gap appropriately, then what we would have is a completely dual figure to the first one. So in that case, uh, we could have a situations where actually all the disturbances happen at the same point in space instead. So if we now regulate on a time gap, it's interesting then to see that then each vehicle should have its position at um, a time gap delta t away from each other. So we can express this in this form if si here now indicate the position of vehicle i along the road at time t. What is interesting from a control theoretic viewpoint now is that to notice that this is equivalent to say that the velocity of each vehicle should at the same point in space be equal. So VIS should be equal to VI minus S, etc. So what does that suggest? It suggests that the control objective is now translated into two different objectives. One is that every vehicle should keep the same velocity when they are at the same point in space, which can be expressed in this form, right? And then every vehicle should keep its time gap to the vehicle ahead. So it means that we suggest a cascade control loop. Every vehicle should regulate that time gap. And then we have an outer loop here, which have a reference, which is the same re reference for every vehicle. And this we can now formalize and we can make it specific. One can, for instance, collect the time gap together with the velocity error into one criteria like I did here and I call it a timing error and then I can try to keep that small and, and that keeping this time uh, th this time error small delta here keeping that locally small for every vehicle here if I keep it locally small I can guarantee that the whole platoon will be stable in the sense I, I introduced here. So this is a very nice property. It suggests how should we control vehicle platoons. So let's now see how that works in practice, such a controller. So now we change, look down to the left here first. Notice that we don't just have the platoon controllers there. We have introduced also a few other blocks here. So let me indicate what that is. So we assume that we have a road database that tells us the road grade. We realize that the road grade is very important. And I then uh, introduce it here and I say, okay, I, I need that information. That information goes into a platoon coordinator the platoon coordinator now computes the reference velocity. The reference velocity is the same now for every vehicle. So the, you, you communicate that down to the vehicle controller of every vehicle. If we are running that system, you see now that the vehicle velocity over space is now the same for all these three vehicles in the, in the platoon. Of course, now the distance have to change while we are driving, but we monitor that and make sure that we still have always have a distance which is further than, than a minimal distance you have to have. So this was a great success when we come up to, to, with that. And, and a few years ago, a PhD student did a thesis around this and, and so on. And feel free if you want to have more, more information about, uh, about this. By the way, I, I have all the papers and all the material here on my homepage, and, and so so feel free to look to look there later on. Uh, but let me highlight something interesting now. So the platoon coordinator that are is computing these re references of velocity, that platoon coordinator solves a dynamic program. It it doesn't solve this 
on a millisecond level. It solves it typically on 10, 20 second level. So we have some horizon. We have some time there to do these computations. And the interesting thing now is to think about where should those computations be done? Should it be done inside every vehicle controller? Should it be inside the first vehicle controller or, or, or so? And what we realized when we did this was that what is very nice is to think that that could actually be done in the infrastructure. So we can think about a future where the infrastructure computes how the vehicle platoon should behave. So think about it that in the cellular network, you could actually now compute control command for the platoon and send it down to the individual vehicle that implements that. That makes a very nice connection to cellular communication and to the future of cellular communication, to 5G and, and later. So just as a little bit of side story, we have developed new handover mechanisms for cellular communication to support this. So as you know, when you move with your regular phone, with your mobile, when you travel, the, your mobile connect to the cell or, uh, uh, to the base station here, which is closest to you. If we now move here with a platoon, we need to coordinate and make sure that all the communication to this base station happens in a coordinated fashion. And this, this can be done with, uh, with a little bit of improvement of the existing system here so that they are synchronized. So that enables basically controlling mobile systems in general over 5G in a very efficient way. And this is something we have developed together with Ericsson here in Stockholm. And we, we, we got a test bed for this a couple of years ago to implement and, and develop this. But let's leave uh, that part, but, but come back to the platooning. So leave the control of individual platoon and moving up. We need to form platoon. We talked about that, right? Forming platoon means that there come two platoons that should merge smoothly at some point here in, in, in the space. So that is done very similar to what I described earlier, but now on a platoon level. So these platoon have some reference velocities and then they merge and of course when they have merged all the vehicles in the platoon have to keep the same velocity as i just described so that system now is another control system which is a one layer up so the information about the vehicles and about the traffic goes in to a predictor and then we have such a formation controller that sends now the reference commands to this platoon so that we we can control this in a nice way Let's go back to another set of experiments that we did. So now we are back in the Stockholm region. We are sitting now in the vehicle in a truck that tries to merge, to tries to form a platoon with a truck that started one kilometer earlier or, or away from us. And you see here that we over and over again are merging with that vehicle. We did that over several weeks. Uh, Six, 600 times we did this experiment over different time of the day. We, of course, recorded all information within the, the platoon of, of, of trucks here, but we also have information from the, vehicle, from the infrastructure. You see down to the left, you see that there are three sensors here that now measure the flow of vehicles so basically the speed of the vehicle as well as the concentration to so the density of the vehicle so this information we get and you see on the videos that we are passing these gates over and over again here so we get these measurements uh, throughout so in stockholm we have that on the highway all around the, the the city so out of this data now we can for instance plot this information here you have the traffic density on the x-axis so how much vehicles there are, and then you have the traffic flow on the, on the y-axis. And you see now that uh, as we, uh, th that we, we are kind of 
uh, have situations where the density is very, very high and we have low traffic flow, low, low, low uh, velocity. But you also see that there are a lot of situations. Most of the situation is just very nicely in this uh, green, yellow uh, uh, region here where the traffic is flowing nicely. So we studied now how can we do platoon formation and how does it depend on the amount of traffic. So the problem we are solving when we are forming a platoon is uh, an optimal control problem. So we have a catch-up phase, we have a platooning phase, which is very long typically, and then we split uh, when, when the vehicles need to leave. And then we formulate an optimal control problem like this one. So we want to minimize the total fuel consumption over now the velocity that these vehicles and the platoon should, should have. So over these three variables, V1, V2, and v, Vp. And these are now subject to the vehicle dynamics uh, and constraints, of course, but also to the traffic dynamics. The difficult part here in this optimal control problem is how do we represent the traffic dynamics? And what we do there is that we use classical models from the literature. So back in the 50s, people studied traffic flow and were thinking about that as a fluid flow. And you use similar model and you see the PDE here, which traditionally is called the LWR PDE model for, for traffic flow. That model we can now work with here and we can use in our optimal control problem formulation. So in the end, the problem looks something like, like this. So kind of a standard optimal control problem uh, with an open middle time here, but a, a, a final split point that is fixed. But, but what is non-standard here is, of course, the model now of the traffic, which, which I didn't write out here because it's, it's, it's complicated, as you saw there. So if we now solve that, let's look at some numerical solutions. So in this plot here, first look at the black dashed line. So you see there are two uh, dashed lines here. So what they represent is now that one vehicle at time point six starts over here at 40 kilometer. Notice that you have have a distance on the x-axis. So we start at 40 kilometers with that. The other vehicle start at zero kilometer. So these two vehicles start, one starts 40 kilometer ahead of the second vehicle. And then these two vehicles keep constant velocity and then they merge after some time because the second vehicle is going a little bit faster. So this is what I showed here with the black dashed line. And then they continue together. And then that you see. So this now was done without assuming that we have any traffic whatsoever. If we don't have any traffic, it's trivial, right? These two vehicles just merge at some point if one vehicle is going a little bit faster than the other one. Now we introduce traffic. And now you look at all the colors in this picture. So higher traffic density means lighter color. So you see that I, 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 it's, it's a variation here of density. If I now run the actual strategy that I have the black thing now with traffic, I will merge later. That's a re red one. I will merge a little bit later. If I solve the problem, the optimal control problem I had on the previous slide, I end up with the solution where I actually merge at the green one. So this, is, uh, so this is an optimal solution of how we should merge if we want to now optimally minimize the fuel consumption. Notice something very interesting here, that um, the, the color coding here behind the vehicle illustrates that when we are driving the trucks, the trucks runs a little bit slower in Sweden, 85 kilometers per hour, while cars run 110 or 120 kilometers per hour on the highway. So the trucks are actually limiting the, 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 the possibility of cars to pass here. So this is called a moving bottleneck. So what you, you can see it from the top plot here, right? So the, the, this vehicle I'm indicating here, right? It makes now blocking partially the highway. So that cars only have two lanes to, to drive on. 
while if we are over here, there are free lanes. So you can view car trucks now as being some sort of actuators in the system that limit somehow the flow of car traffic. And that limitation is smooth, right? And you see that that is what creates a little bit higher congestion in this area that comes, that comes after. So this is very, very interesting. And that is what I'm going to discuss the last part here in my talk. Uh, it's a following question I'm going to answer. Can we now use vehicle platoons, so truck platoons like the one you see here, to actually improve traffic conditions for uh, cars? So can we drive them in a way which is beneficial overall for car traffic on highways? So the story that I just was illustrating on the previous slide, can we do that? Mathematically, we use similar models as you have seen before. So the situation we want to resolve is, for instance, the stop and go wave dissipation. As you see in the videos here, these things can appear actually out of just how humans are driving. That becomes like this stop and go wave in the traffic. One could regulate the flow from a, a, a fluid flow from a macro perspective. It's called the Euler approach. This is, for instance, in some cities or highways implemented by that you have digital speed limits. You have signs which suggest that you should not drive uh, faster than 90 kilometer or something or 50 or, or so. We use another approach here, which is called the Lagrange approach. So we suggest instead to control individual vehicles. So namely these platoons, as I, I was showing you. So to illustrate this in a, in a control architecture, what we do is that we now measure the density in each of these segments. So think back at that video I showed you. We were measuring the density in flow in each such segment. So we do that along the highway here. We feed that back into a controller. The controller then suggests the velocity for the truck platoon. If we have a traffic jam over here, we could then regulate the distance appropriately. So let's look at how that, that uh, is. So we have a similar plot as before. So we have different density of traffic. We have a traffic jam, maybe an accident that happens after 40 kilometer here. So you see, we get this yellow area. Yellow area means very high density of, of the traffic, right? So this, uh, there is, this jam is propagating now backwards in space, but forward in time. So we have this yellow area. Now we drive a truck here, a truck platoon. The truck platoon goes a little bit slower than the cars, as you see. Then we come to this congested area, and then it goes even slower. And then following there, we, we then continue after the traffic jam. So what I suggest here and what we have developed is that we can compute now a, a, a speed that the track platoon should hold in order to actually meet the congestion area exactly when it's being dissolved. And it's being dissolved here because the track platoon act as a moving bottleneck and it is reducing the amount of car traffic that, that now moves into the congested area. So this looks like it's better for the truck, but it's also better for all the cars. How much better it is? So here we did some more experiments where if we don't do any control for every car here, on average, the, the total travel time increase is 38%. If we do that type of control that I indicate now, the total travel time increase due to the congestion is instead just increased by 8%. So it's a drastic improvement for all the cars in the situations, thanks to this control that we have been presenting. What I showed you there was based on perfect information that we have perfect state information from this type of measurement devices I showed. But this can also be done by actually using the vehicle here, not only as actuators, in this case, this red line indicates the actuating uh, truck platoons, but we can also use them as sensor. So we can recover the information of the state, basically building an observer 
that utilizes the information of vehicles when we, so to say, turn them on as sensors. And then we can turn them on as actuators as well. So from a control theoretic viewpoint, this is fascinating. We are using now a, a reconfigurable distributed or network control system where actuators and sensors come and go in the system. And we do this in order now to, in this particular situation, improve the traffic condition. So this is what I would like to, to tell you about in the beginning. To conclude now, I, I would like to, to uh, emphasize that we have developed this automated road freight transport system, cyber fiscal system, if you want, with different layers. We have described this system from the different layers. We have been developing each layer separately, but also the integrated part of this. I only have time to go through some snapshots here. Again, if you're interested, go to my homepage and you will find these overview papers also describing the overall system and, and so on. Everything is not solved here. There is a lot of interesting, interesting uh, problems on different layers in this architecture. The overall motivation I talked about here was lower fuel and operation cost, but there is a great interest of this work also from a societal viewpoint. We work with the authority in Sweden, in Europe and elsewhere in order to see how can we in, few, in the future actually make something good for, for mankind in general to operate this system so that they do some um, social good here. On the more technical side, I was describing some of the vehicle and uh, platoon controllers in the beginning and then in the end here I come to more recent work about how we can use vehicle platoons to reduce traffic congestion in a dynamic dynamic way. And I, I in the very end we talk about this how to use vehicles as sensors and actuators and how this can be done dy dynamically. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. And I hope um, also that we have some more time for, for some questions and discussion. I'm, I, I will have uh, uh, some more minutes also after 11 o'clock, if that is fine. Uh, Stockholm time here, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a really interesting presentation. So I'd like... Uh, to ask audience if they have any questions, they can unmute themselves and ask the question directly. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, so it was. Thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, like I had just one simple question regarding the resilience of the whole dis of the whole system. Like, if one of them fails, how is how will the whole system manage to uh, keep itself in the a stable manner is there any uh, insight could you give some insight into that yes that 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 is a great question an extremely important uh, question thank you for that as, as i was mentioning in the very beginning right safety come number one here in, in in all these things so what you mentioned is actually the first thing that we 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 studied here so you this is something sometimes called a graceful degradation so what happens if you are, if I rephrase your question, what's happening if we are driving in this platoon and then a sensor of one of the vehicle is, is not working or I'm not able to measure the distance or I'm losing the connectivity here. So in these cases, the system automatically increases the distance to the vehicle ahead. So the, the, if you have less information in the system here, what you do then is that you basically increase the distance and by that you, you increase your safety margin. In the extreme case, so to say, what happens is, is that their operator or the driver have to take over. So you see that, that that is like a dynamic way of handling. So you make sure that you always keep the system safe. And, and resilient in this way that it can tolerate various types of communication imperfections, sensor imperfections or, or other things. And if this happens, the system needs to detect them and then you take uh, action based on that. You, so to say, make the control problem simpler if you want. If you want. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions. 
one is like uh, once the platooning has happened and let's say we have a platoon of four vehicles then what is the communication happening between them like it's vehicle to vehicle or like every vehicle is talking to every other vehicle or only the neighbors yeah the, the, another important question right so in the experiment you saw here uh, in, in most of the experiment out on uh, these out on the real highways and so on there we are using the standard today vehicle to vehicle communication so, so it, it's something similar uh, to 802.11. It's called 802.11p is one such standard, which is for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication over, over Wi-Fi technology. So, so this is what, what's being used in this experiment. In these cases, typically, you know, these long haul truck have a trailer, right? So they can be far, quite, uh, quite long. So typically, you can communicate to, to the next vehicle or sometimes even to the next next vehicle but not more than that so it's not possible we, with this today's technology there to 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 communicate to all the vehicles without doing multi-hop communication but then if we look at the other part of what i talked about so so something which is very intensive uh, research on now is exactly this of not only using vehicle to vehicle but using cellular communication so vehicle to infrastructure to vehicle communication and this looks very very promising and as you as many of you know we we five years for instance this it has been uh, set completely different requirements to be able to support real-time control one use case is exactly this type of uh, platooning or vehicle con uh, control applications so in our experiments there that we do it, it works very well and what we foresee is that goes back to the previous questions resilience i think that in the future we will see multiple type of radio interfaces here so that one can switch between different type of communication modes or having multiple communication modes in parallel in order to reason about the information you get and make the system more secure more resilient and and and, and so on but it's in, important to so to understand that we cannot instantaneously share all information between all vehicles because it's simply too too heavy and and it's not uh, working in that way because th there needs some understanding about the control we are doing together with what communication possibilities there are thank you uh, yeah thanks um, my last question is that uh, like how does this platoon coordinator like what is the role of platoon coordinator like is it some sort of centralized controller for all the vehicles or uh, is it an offline uh, controller type uh, controller like no to that in 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 um, the result i showed here yeah i can go a little bit more into detail what 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 is actually the controller underlying controller here so the vehicle controller that we implement in these experiments the safety control that sits in in each vehicle that is a receding horizon controller uh, an mpc controller with a short time horizon and a high uh, frequency um, uh, sampling uh, sampling rule uh, rule right so think about that closing the loop on the level of uh, hundreds of milliseconds or, or something like that when we then move up to that controller you you mentioned there the coordinator i i called there that is something similar we actually use we actually solve a dynamic program but we do that with a receding horizon <clears throat> sorry and that horizon is over about one kilometer or so so we it's a horizon now that is over you know maybe half up to half a minute or, or or something of that range this is done at the level of seconds a sampling sampling rate but the horizon is of that length and why a range of some kilometer so that is basically the level of when you need to adjust the velocity of the platoon so depending on the road grade of a highway as well as changes in the platoon and so on so there is a clear separation of the the, the two controllers that sit in the uh, in the system uh, here but that that's the way it's implemented and again there was um, 
another student here, Valeri Turi, who developed this, this particular part you were asking on now, and, and I'm happy to share the details also of these controllers there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. That's it for me. Any other question? Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, so while so solving the optimal control problem, that is, uh, uh, which was constrained by the tra transport equation, the PDE, so how are you solving this problem? Is it a, uh, are you dealing uh, with this as a trajectory optimization problem or maybe solving it by PMP yeah. something? Another another great question. Uh, thank you for paying uh, this good attention. So I, there is another separation here, which uh, when we go into detail, it becomes important. So the the two lower layers that I just talked about in the previous question, they are basically opt. So the lowest layer is optimized uh, or or is is concerned about safety. The second layer we talked about, which looked over some kilometer that is is dealing with the local optimization of the fuel efficiency and now your question there Siddhartha is is dealing with the platoon efficiency so there we are actually optimizing over piecewise constant velocities so we are thinking about you know we, we are not changing the the velocity down on a second level uh, level or something like that right so it's, it's like a piecewise constant velocity this piecewise constant velocity of this moving bottleneck, which I said the the, the uh, tracks are acting uh, in the in the um, in the traffic, is now basically just represented as a block in the in the uh, in the traffic. So mathematically, it means that we are looking at the front uh, as a front there in the PD. So the, if you want the ODE, which is basically the, the platoon, has a very simple type of dynamics. It's, it's uh, right. It's just moving there inside the PDE. And then we are solving that. What is now a good way of regulating these fronts or these blocks inside the PDE? And, and uh, what is the consequence of the, so to say, the influence of the PDE on that, on that block? So that is the problem we are solving on that level and we then come back to suggesting the reference velocity for the platoon not the reference velocity then for the individual individual vehicle and a follow-up question that you might wonder about so what about priorities here what about if the controller that you ask about if that suggests another velocity that a lower layer suggests yeah, there is priorities in this system that is bottom up. So always highest priority on the safety on the lowest layer. And then the, the priority, so to say, loosens up. And, and this again, come back to a very natural engineering principle to make sure that it's safe and you optimize, so to say, criteria, uh, you know, as they, uh, as the system you are considering grows in in uh, in scale and space here thank you for that question yeah okay thank you so I, anyone else has any question okay sir uh, I had some questions, but you, the, they were answered immediately in the next slide itself. So uh, it was a nice presentation. So thank you very much for your time again. So uh, now if anyone has no, no questions, we can call it a day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And thanks again for listening. And thanks for the great questions. It's really a, a, a great pleasure uh, here. And uh, I, I, I hope I wish you all a, a happy new uh, <laughs> Um, better next year <laughs> and i hope you will stay safe over the holidays if you have such coming up now as well so th thank you all and let's Arsh, hope we can i yeah. say something yes sir so uh, professor okay. Dalton, we have, uh, our professor ravi Bandamar here with us so he would address uh hello
Carl. This is Ravi Barnava from Systems and Control. Thank you very much for that nice talk to our student group here. And uh, it's uh, so these guys are trying to get uh, reputed people speak to them every now and then. So it was very nice of you, and I enjoyed the talk as well. I think I had heard a part of maybe a part of the talk you gave at the ECC in. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, am I correct? Uh, uh, in uh, was it in somewhere in the Scandinavian countries? Now I'm trying to recall where that was. Yeah, you 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 have a very good memory. You're absolutely right. I gave a plenary at at the ECC in in Denmark a few years ago. Yes, yeah, so some you you have seen some of the early part, the, the experiment there. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's correct. Yeah, because it brought back memories of that. And uh, nonetheless, it was very nice and interesting. And uh, thanks a lot. And we keep hearing of the unique way that Sweden has been looking at the COVID pandemic. So uh, and uh, we wonder sometimes which of the reports are to be believed and which of the reports are not to be believed. So I it, it's uh, with the type of contradictory data from different parts of the world. So uh, it's uh, it's just an observation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Don't 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 believe everything you 